always recommend, if possible, to go in pairs. Even if you just have a friend that goes with you, if you're on your own individually, just have somebody go with you because two people listening to one person talk, one can kind of take notes and the other can really listen. And it helps you to really hear what they're saying. So really listen to them, and that's kind of the pivot. The other thing, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the difference between process and method. And this comes a little bit out of the lean startup. We used to have a business plan, right? And that was the process for starting a business, was you write a business plan. And a lot of companies did this. There was a, a refrigeration company in Northern Colorado that started out, and you guys may know, um, what was it, now we're trying to blank on what it was called, uh, Ice Technologies or? Ice Energy. Ice Energy, right? And they started out, um, Gary used to work with them, and, and uh, they started out thinking one customer, and they developed this whole business plan about this customer, and they raised a lot of money, and, and they went out and then found that it wasn't, the customer didn't want it. And so after they raised all this money and spent all this money and developed the product and the prototype and all this, they went, oh, the customer said no. Excuse me, snap. <laughs> and they had a pivot and start to find it. Gary showed me all the data they did and the research they did and they really found out that it wasn't the building owner that ended up being their customer. The last time they were going after was the um, power company, power companies wanted their product. So there was this whole big pivot, but they spent, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to get to the point where they, they, they should have been much less expensive. And that's what we're trying to do in here is get you to start on this search before you spend a lot of money. Minimize the upfront cost to make sure that you focus on the business model, and we're going to be talking about methods in here to do that. This is not a process to have a successful startup. When you go through all these steps at the end, there is no guarantee that it's going to work. But the methodology <coughs> reduces risk and increases the probability of success. Do you have to go through this? No to have a successful business. Do you have to do anything? No. I know people that started businesses that are successful that didn't write a business plan, that didn't do any research and they just pulled the trigger and they started the business and they learned as they went. The best way to, to be an entrepreneur is to start your business. You guys, right? You were out hauling stuff around this summer. You just started the business. You learn as you go. So we talk a lot about methodologies and methods, but this isn't a process that guarantees success at the end. And this is about search versus operation. So the lean startup methodology and the business model canvas are just tools to help you frame and define what you're doing. How many of you, do you all have your canvas done, the first run through the canvas? Because we're gonna go through those tonight. Right, at least a rough, rough draft of a canvas. Right, because it helps you start to frame it. It gives you terms. Are there other business model me um, methods out there? Yeah, there's other ways of defining business models. There's Behringer has one, and you know a lot of different people out there. But the one we're using with the canvas, Osterwilders, is very popular right now and is. And it works well, and that's why we selected to use that. Um, I, won't, I had a couple other slides, I'm not gonna go through those, but I wanna talk just a brief, uh, just a few minutes about business models and what that means. What's your understanding of a business model? What do you guys know? The functionality of an, an entity functionality of an entity, okay? What else? Processes involved. Okay, the processes involved. What you're selling, who's buying it, what makes it different, how you can make that product. What you're selling, okay, those 
again? Who's buying? How you're going to make it? How you're going to make it? What makes it different? What makes it different? Okay. Is there a standard business model? Is there one model that fits all? No, no, no. It's actually to be your competitive advantage. One of the keys that a lot of times where he talked about is the revenue model is pretty important. How do you plan to make money? Right? That's that bottom quartile. We'll talk about those. But a lot of you are pretty far along. We're all at different places. And this first part, God bless you, this first part of this next 16 weeks, what we go through, we're going to go through the canvas in great detail. And some of you, you know, have been out selling already, and you're, you're, you're going ahead. And you may not all get something out of every session. But, excuse me, there, i got to hide quick. Oh, hey. Thank you. But you will be able to pull something out, I believe, if you come with an open mind and listen to these different topics and work through it. Some of you may want to go and say, I want to start selling to customers, right? Start, go quick. And, you know, I mean, Je you'll have to talk to Jess about that, right? I mean, I'd say go for it. But keep coming and keep doing the work in this class because it's going to help you define what you're doing much better so that at the end of this session, when you go into the next thing, you have a workable business model. The business model is essentially on all those components on the canvas. And it clearly states how you function in each of those areas. There also, one part that he leaves out is team. And we'll talk a little bit on that business model at a point during the semester where we talk about building your team. Because there may be team issues that you need. And, and the canvas doesn't have that on there. Right? So the canvas isn't the end all be all. But it's a starting point for us to talk about things. Um, what did, was there anything else we kind of talked about? What else was I supposed to? Am I, I think I went through quicker than I thought. We could talk about the different business models. A lot of them have to do, well, with the revenue models. So. Um, What's, what's a B2B business? Another terminology. What's business to business? What's another version of that? Who else can you sell to? B2C, which is business to customer. There's one more big one. In the US, it's about a third of the total GDP. Business to government, B2G. Governments can be potential um, customers. They consume a huge amount of things. They also provide a lot of financing. But you know, you have to look at and understand those business models. Who is your customer? And you guys started to talk a little bit about what's the difference between <coughs> a customer and a user? Okay. All right. So when we talk about who's your customer? Well, I feel like when you're talking about who's our customer, you're talking about the customer as a whole, like customers, advertisers. Okay. We're talking about like users who get to use your help every day. And so of those two, which is the most important? And so you have to talk to both right. as you go through. You can't just ignore one and not talk to the other. And, and you have to be really thoughtful about that. Because your business model might change. Yours is pretty clear that the, there's a customer that pays and a user that consumes. Now, you can also have that user pay. Right. Mm -hmm. right? If you've got great stuff. And so you really have to develop that portion of your business model. Right, and some of the other, um, let's see, I mean, your customer and user is pretty clear that it's together. Um, I don't know, I don't know. She's, she's selling, 
She's selling to buyers. She's selling to the buyers. Well, that's <laughs> true, right? That depends on her distribution. Well, yeah, it depends yeah. on your distribution model, whether you go direct or whether you go to buyers. Yeah, because you, you are. If you go, if you're not selling direct to the customer, then you've got to sell to a buyer before you sell to a user. And you got to understand that. And I mean, and selling in big box companies is a hard thing to do, right? But you got to understand that relationship. Great point. Thanks, Russ. Can I kind of add on to that, though? Yeah. Um, so, as Brian, we've already kind of had our own um, things, and we just want to big buyers like Jackson, and then box of Jackson. It's, it takes a long time. It's, there's some, some companies, they their buyer has to get the item approved by the, like Jackson, it has to be approved by the owner. Then it has to get it approved by a higher up. So, they have to wait on that higher up to actually approve it, and then they actually buy it from you. So, like, they want to have a portion of it. Well, and uh, my my market has a lot of trade shows and conventions, uh, so networking is very big. So I recommend you guys, everyone, try to track down any sort of trade show that you may be able to build connections because that's where a lot of our business happens. Is that's how we meet our buyers. We create our booths and things like that. These are private events, so just kind of finding those and knowing them. And one of the things. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think you guys probably would all, like easily, you guys could all say you could throw out two business model canvases because you have to have users and you have to have buyers. You have to convince people that this is enough value for the user. So you have a business model for the user, same like you guys, you have that business model for the user, and then you have another business model for your economic buyer because there's two completely different value propositions, they're two totally different companies. So you could probably, every single company that you And the thing that, that you'll see in that online tool that I gave you, with the different color stickies, it talks in there that you're gonna have different customers when you go through there, and the customer has a certain color sticky, so you use pink. Let's just say for the buyer, you use pink. For the um, retail shopper, you use green. And then throughout the rest, especially under value, right, the value proposition, well the buyer, what's the value proposition? You have the same color sticky for those, so that's where you get the unity on the canvas. So you don't actually have to have multiple, but you have the same one, but you have different customers on there. Um, I was funny, I once had a, had a, had a friend um, who was a crab fisherman, and I had him do his canvas just to kind of show it in class. And he listed 30 customers that he had to address in his, because he had all sorts of different customers where he had to, there was a value proposition to them, right? I mean, he was a, one of the, um, uh, well, he was, he worked out at the Hemisphere for a while, but he, he was a crab fisherman. He was a fisherman in Alaska. And so he'd sell to, he'd have some customer, the end user, he'd sell directly to restaurants for really premium stuff. He could make some contacts there. He'd sell to a broker. He'd sell to these giant ships out on the ocean that bought his catch before he actually even went into port. So he had the, the, the model that way, and then he had the value proposition for each one of those aligned. So as you build this, you have to understand the different customers that you're dealing with, and what's the value proposition that, why do they care? Right, and so you can build it that way. Um, Oh, one other thing to remember, as a startup, uh, Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm, and in some of his, his work, and they, they talk about that chasm, which is about 13% of the market, where you get into the, you're not in the early adopters, you're in the, um, you know, those innovators, you're, you get into the early adopters when you go over that 13%, so if you have a bell curve, remember it. For those of you from the marketing class, you have, um, so this group right, right here, these are the, those innovators. This is the early adopters, late um, adopters, and then these are the laggards. The, the laggards are the people 
that still use rotary phones at home, right? The, the only reason they change something is because they have to, it's not offered anymore. The early adopters are the people that will buy anything new. I have a brother-in-law that way. He has every technology toy in the world. He buys it no matter what because it's new. He, you know, those are the guys that, those are the Apple consumers that stood in the line for nine hours when they could wait a week later and you know, not have to. But the key for an entrepreneur is to cross this chasm from early adopt from, from the innovators to the early adopters. Because when you start your business, the innovators are going to be your customers. You know, you start your clothing line and you can get a pitch to Macy's, but they're not gonna probably buy from you until you're in business for a couple of years so that they're sure you can provide what needs to be done, right? People, essentially a lot of entrepreneurs when they first start out sell to other risk takers, right? Somebody trying to um, get a competitive advantage. It's hard to start to sell to these folks in here. Yeah? What do you think are the biggest pitfalls when talking, talking to innovators to early adopters? Okay, what are some of the challenges? Where you see companies turn around. Okay. Well, let's let's open that up. What do you think some of the challenges will be to get from the brand new, you know, those innovators to more established customers? What do you think some of those will be? You guys can pitch in too. Reliability. Would be kind of okay, reliability. Yeah, like a reputation. A reputation. Well, okay, money and price, which, what's the difference? You said money? What, what do you mean by that? You need, you need a finance equivalent of something, right? Okay, so there's, there's capital, how fast you can grow, how much money you have, and how you choose to grow. Because remember, you don't have to raise money. You can grow organically. That's a choice you make. And with each of those comes advantages and consequences. And then the price you charge is, you're talking about the price? And um, usually the innovators are willing to pay a higher price even if it's not bottom of the middle product, but there's some people who will need you to lower the price a lot, and there's other people who will just too low the price that they get good at the sale. So yeah, when, when we get into pricing, that's a whole, another issue, but one of the things a former, um, what's it, uh, Stuff and Mellows guys always said, we need Have big margins. Don't compete on price. Have big margins because big margins let you make mistakes. And he says he guarantees you're going to make mistakes. If you don't have margins, you you have no room for error. And so when you sell to them, right? I mean, geez, these guys paid you know fifty thousand dollars for the first flat screen TV. So you don't have to be as concerned about price, you have to understand what they're willing to pay. And that comes from understanding the customer. You know, I would and think about this when you're out interviewing people, especially if you if you got this socially conscious message kind of thing, because there'll be all, they'll, if, you, if you select the people that are really inter into whatever socially conscious movement you have, you'll get all this wonderful feedback. Oh, that's really, really wonderful. And there's a, my, one of my favorite books on this is called The Mom Test. And it's really about how do you ask a question of a customer that you'll get the truth. Okay, you're not asking your mom, would you buy this? Your mom said, oh yeah, it's really lovely. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Ask somebody in the early adopter or, you know, ask somebody in the general populace, would you buy this? And oh, by the way, it happens to be socially conscious, you know, whatever kind of thing. And see if they'll bite on it. See if that's important enough or um, try to suss out, you know, where the real, that real value is. Yeah, try to understand that. And that just goes into really trying to understand your customer, and as you're talking to them, be 
smart in your selection because you, you know you, you have a way to track and build those, but you want to make sure that you talk to customers in all areas, areas, not just those early innovators, or you'll get a skewed perception of the probability of your success. Yeah. So I sort of said to them that I let him talk in my introduction and session, and by the end I said, so what you're telling me is this. So you're not telling me if you couldn't get on to the session, if you beat X, Y, Z, and then built your contractor, you wouldn't be excited. And he's like, oh my gosh, I am your pro I am your market. And so I think some of it is, you have to stop thinking who the market is and listen, because they might tell you that they actually do fit the market. Well, and that, I guess that goes to you asking the right questions as well, yeah. so understanding questions. A, a comment on the curve. Yeah. Um, if you're a product-based business, uh, consider volumes. Because as you crest that hill onto one small Jack's with four stores, right. to a uh, Macy's, your volumes increase, therefore your costs increase, therefore your liabilities increase, mm -hmm. therefore your returns increase. So all of that stuff, that stuff has a huge factor on your bottom line. So it's easier to go after a McGuckins in this neighborhood or a Jack's because they love small entrepreneurs with one SKU. So going to a Macy's with one SKU just won't happen. Uh, that, that's been my experience on right. a product-based uh, uh, audience. Macy's will carry the one SKU customer if <coughs> there's huge customer demand for it. And they'll typically only do that from a customer, uh, a, a company who is huge in themselves, even though they may have one SKU, but they're big in their own right. Yeah. Did you have a question, Carl? Yeah. Um, Russ was, was touching on it, um, the idea of crossing the chasm, and Jeffrey, Jeffrey Moore's um, analogy here, when you're targeting, you really need to make sure that you're targeting the right part of the galaxy to see the recurve. Because if, you're, if your product really fits the late majority and you are talking to innovators, you're gonna get bad feedback. Right? So make sure you, when you're targeting, you target it correctly and asking the right demographic that you're, uh, that you're trying to learn so that you can in, in put, put it into your product. Perfect. Other challenges with crossing that chasm? Uh, just knowledge, uh, especially in the <coughs> world, that's not something I'm really concerned about because I know a lot of early adopters who understand the need for environmentally conscious clothing. However, the general public doesn't quite, even a lot of people within my group don't understand it. So I feel like um, that would be a huge hurdle I need to overcome is figuring out how to convey my message quickly and efficiently to the larger group. <coughs> and it may not be, um, and it may not be enough to be your competitive advantage, right? That, I mean, in all honesty, that's the, the challenge there is because people, not enough people care. And you may be too early, right? Yeah. An another point about crossing the chasm is really about technology adoption. So it's the technology adoption curve. And so technologies that are not new, so it's innovations, and crossing the chasm is about taking something brand new into the market. So the VR guys have more of a crossing of the chasm thing um, going on. You have more of a, um, an issue, lots of people are making sustainable clothing, making stuff out of hemp and so forth. So your issue is a little bit different. You're not really looking to cross any technology chas chasm. You're looking to cross a mental mindset and so your issue is a different one. Yeah, go ahead and then we'll go over there. So early on, you said this in a couple of startups, is inability to manage team conflict or building the team something that's big, a big deal? Mm -hmm. Oh, in terms of getting over that, yeah. The team conflict is, <coughs> is a huge issue. And it, I mean, it's something, I think you need to start talking a lot among your teams and often. Right? Did you have a comment? Another comment is just the 
uh, in looking at that gap, it's really that, that we are looking at this, this hardware and kind of having like, if you build something up here, but then the hardware changes and it takes a feed out point of view in terms of what you can do and access kind of codes within the product supply chain to, to who can access what we're trying to bring to people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, that, I mean, I think that's a really almost broad format of innovators because usually, uh, you know, not everybody necessarily has a, the next best thing. So you're trying to always solve that problem and then have to sort of adapt and have it. And I think James's comment to you guys, you should take to heart. Who is your customer? What problem are you solving? Because it, that's the key for where you have to find your success is to find a problem that people need solved, right? In 3D, you know, it's a little bit like the, so the Sony Walkman when it first came out. Nobody knew they needed a Sony Walkman. And it took a company as big as Sony to be able to create that demand and that awareness. A little startup couldn't have made the Sony Walkman a reality. Right? And, and you have a little bit of that trouble. So you have to find that customer that has a huge problem. Comment? Yeah. Um, your approach really is more around um, the innovator's dilemma, which is a take what you can throw away. Um, and if you go back and look at that, it's about um, building too much functionality over time and reducing the functionality to fit the market. So that would be a good That's a good, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and then um, your yeah, point about, about the same, go ahead. What was that about? Uh, the innovator's dilemma by Clay Christensen. And then your point about the Sony Walkman <coughs> is an interesting point for everybody because you all have intuition about what you're building. You, and that's how the Sony Walkman was developed. The, we had intuition because there were, um, there were transistor radios, radios back in our day. With a single earphone. Yep. And he said, huh, they worked back then in the 60s, and um, now it's the 70s coming out, and the Sony Walkman has had a case in it. And he said, if it could fit in my pocket, and he had this intuition to start with, so it's called intuition marketing. And that was a day when there was tons of market research. You did market research for a year before you launched a product. And he flipped it around and said, and I have this intuition, let me build it, and they may come. Yeah. And that's, and that's an expensive way to go. Yeah. And only a, a bigger company can kind of afford that. Right. right? But then, you know, that's the, the challenge with that. But it is, it is that intuition. You may have an intuition. What we want to do here is test that intuition. Yeah. Test your what your assumptions, right? Because if you don't test your assumptions, then they can make a, uh, an ass out of you and me, right? An <laughs> assumption. Right? So, sorry. I swear sometimes. I enjoy the discussion, so come ready to talk. All right, y'all. Is there anybody that does not have their business model canvas with them, either in hard copy or digital format? All right, so we've got some mentors here. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and like steal a couple of our mentors as well. But I'm just going to break you guys up into four different groups. So if you guys want to just, you can use your chairs or whatever, or get up and look at your canvas up on the wall, whatever you want to do. But I want to just go ahead and create a couple groups and then we, um, uh, Bert and I, <coughs> will be kind of going around your groups and trying to help you work through those canvases. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started with one with one team. Starts out and just says, and we're just gonna really going to be focusing on the big boxes. We don't need to talk about the whole thing. We just unfortunately don't have time. Um, but we're going to be talking about the big boxes, like your value proposition, your customer, revenues, costs, Partnerships. Those are the five big boxes of that business model canvas. And let's just go ahead and start with value proposition and customer and go from there. If we've got time, we can kind of expand. But those are the two real big pieces that we want you to, to start to really hone in on. And so, why don't we break them into groups is real easy. So one can then go to another group. Oh, we're the city. Yeah. Okay. And so because you guys have the two biggest teams, why don't you guys go together and have the teams since you guys have the most people? So uh first one was Blue Penguin and SideQuest. And Laborjack, um, Sapiens, and Agile. You guys can three be together. You ladies, three of you right here together. And, and 
separate out so you're, you're clustered yeah. in a way. So you really kind of create a group because that way the mentors that we could come to your table, go through and then we'll shift. Well, we should try to shift sessions too. At some point, the mentors will rotate. Yes. So, Dean, Russ, Jim, Rich, if you guys want to walk, I mean, you guys are free just to walk around and kind of give some advice and feedback, that'd be helpful. researching you on a website and filling something out uh, per se without having that face-to-face uh, -face or over-the-phone communication. So we found that having a company phone and leaving our phone number direct to us on the advertisement, uh, there were times when we had five, six calls within a four to five hour period on an afternoon on a weekend. Um, so being able to fill that demand was another thing, but um, yeah, definitely that uh, customer relationship um, is something we really want in our company. Right. Uh, that really yeah, speaks to that, the actually. Other uh, can, uh, can you something off the yeah. service where you can just hire help, like basically. Yeah, you can sell some business. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Uh, and they're making a huge margin on it. And you 
65 jobs this summer. Um, basically, what we kind of thought was you know, there's you know, this whole new where we load it up into a rental truck and then we'll drive it to the new location and unload it. Um, and then most of our business was for a lot of partial move where we just load it or somebody would come into town and they have a new call. They're tired, they don't want to unload it themselves, so they called us and we can load it. Um, and we had a fair amount of odd jobs where we rearrange furniture within a house. Two hundred and fifty percent. Man, is that rocket? Yeah. We, and so it wasn't necessarily all moving. Either. One, one thing we found with uh, the customer segment, which we think we can translate into um, the tech piece, is once we go establish that relationship with them, um, we're then able to pry them for more information. And they sometimes that happens in the reverse. They're like, "Hey, can you also do rock jobs?" And we're like, "Yeah, sure. We can get some help on the rock job." So if we had that tech piece, we could um, go out, establish that relationship, and then tell them, we have an app developed where you can get labor for not only moving, but this too. Would you be interested in downloading? So, yeah, most, mainly what we did, we, we marketed towards the same thing, and that was kind of our, our marketing niche. And what we found is that, you know, you know, we're not going to turn down business. Yeah, we have no problem selling college, college students that are working for us. I mean, they had no problem except they were working for four hours and four hours. So, so that is that is the other interesting piece of our segment. Just like Jess brought up, we should have two of these. One for the the labor jacks, as we'll call them. Uh, so the labor jacks is the eager to work college student who wants to make more than a retail job would pay. So we paid twelve dollars an hour all summer. Um, and well, yeah, twelve dollars an hour plus tip. So it ended up on average, I'd say. I didn't have another job besides doing this, and I probably made eighteen dollars an hour. So if we if we advertise, hey, look, you're going to be making twelve dollars an hour plus tips to college students. Um, they'd all want to work for us. You decide when you want to do the move. Whatever. So what we can do is um, have a, a client testimonials and tools that create online profiles with our technology platform. So specifically, as a tech team, through movie scheduling, we have it seems like you might be Josh coaching with the pain they have. Is it your bot? Your movie profile people like Yelp. What are they doing now? So these are people in the community that have used these exact movers at this moving company. And why is exact movers? The client gets comforted in knowing that they have somebody, their peers, and their relatives establish credit for the way that they know that the company is going to sterilize. So, because every company has a reason to come to them. It's just other reasons they have a specific person. If I could sort of interject, Uber, um, you want an Uber, you can literally see a picture of the driver with a little thing. I mean, everybody who goes and rides an Uber, boom, at the end of the Uber, they rate it five stars, four and a half, four, right, right then and there. So um, if we could, if we could translate a little bit of Uber's model and how they how uh, customers who are uh, having these people drive them around, um, they want to know um, a little bit more about them, and sometimes it would help to just see that picture of them, see the star rating, and it gives them more assurance. Okay. 
But as it, it's something that differentiates us from all the there was a competition the Blue Ocean Challenge and you and I were on committee and they this girl was selling instant one or two dollars on demand kids in India on demand accessible on the Craigslist was our channel, so Facebook, Craigslist, and our website. I mean, if I buy my one house, I don't know that I buy software. So yeah, our customer segment. Um, actually, I think we touched on that just a little bit. But there's there's the person that needs full service move, right? Um, and our customer. It's a big issue. So for instance. We have a dentist who has a family of five and he's moving from one house in a neighborhood uh, to a bigger house in that same neighborhood. And he wants us to load the truck, drive the truck, unload the truck, drive back with an empty truck, load it again, back and forth. And then there's the person who is moving from an office to another office across town. I don't know We show up, she has all her stuff boxed up already. She rented the U-Haul, had the U-Haul there. Um, all we did was load the truck up, follow her in the U-Haul, and unload the truck because she needed the labor to um, So yeah, and Rich, we actually had talked with you about that. Um, there should be different prices for different jobs. This summer we charged $25 an hour, um, no matter what the job was, no matter how long the hours were and how many employees there were. were. Or um, so, so for the full service one, maybe you charge uh, one price, and we need to figure out what that price is. Um, for uh, the smaller scale, uh, one hour long job, charge something different. And you can gain more customers by charging those different prices. Is And that's where the affinity diagram comes into play. And we can we have 65 people we can go contact right now and um, sort of differentiate where they fit on that spectrum. Is U-Haul not on this I got the helpers right now. U-Haul? Yeah, I would say they're directly there. Yeah, we need to get the whole U-Haul. Yeah, we need to get the whole U-Haul. Yeah, we need to get the whole U-Haul. Oh, you guys need to keep going. Okay, you guys need to keep going. Yeah, you guys need to keep going. Already going to no, that's, 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 that's yeah. In 20 minutes. Sure. Do you want to go? Or? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so, all right, so I tested it out.